Mm. Okay. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Is everybody awake this morning? No, that's okay. I'm, you know, to be honest, I wasn't really awake this morning either, but that's okay. That's what coffee's for. I mean, doesn't, it kind of works now, but, you know, I was about to make a rude comment, but I'm not going to do that. So, um, okay. Let's move this a little bit. I'm moving around a lot. Wow. Just overwhelmed by the goodness of God. Um, <laughs> he has been so faithful, even through struggle, even through trial. And I think sometimes uh, we feel like we get to this point where we feel like he owes us something and he doesn't. But the thing is, he shows up anyways. So last week, I see that, wow, there's a lot of people. People coming back from last week, that's good. Is it, was anybody like last week like, what the heck? Anybody? It's okay if you were like, this is weird. No one? Awesome. Great. All right, let's move on. Um, yeah, so we talked about, we kind of, we we're experiencing some pretty, pretty awesome things in the church, um, just really seeing, um, seeing God move, but also watching, this isn't cool, but it's kind of cool because um, if, we're not, if, if we're not coming up against resistance, then we're not going the right direction. So we've kind of, we're seeing some resistance come up from the enemy and like just partnering with God just to like, just stomp the enemy. And I, um, yeah, we talked about a lot of interesting things. So again, if you still have questions about that, um, we are available to you to talk about that. So we talked a lot about going through the gate, right? See, Jesus, he opened up the kingdom, right? Right? The kingdom, you remember back in the garden, like Adam and Eve were walking in perfection with God. And then when they decided to sin, then came the curse, and then they were kicked out of the garden. Why? Like, God, why are you so mean? Because God wasn't going to let them eat of the tree of life in that state, in a state of being fallen, in a state of sin. Why? Because that is a state of misery. God already knew the plan beforehand. If you look back in the, you know, through the lineage, back in Genesis, it all points to Christ, right? This is fascinating. You should go look it up. If you look in the, the lineage from, from Adam to, was it Noah? Adam to Noah? It's all, you just got to look at it. Just, just trust me. Look up lineage from Adam to Noah and Jesus, and you'll find it probably. It's really fascinating. See, Jesus had, they, God had this plan from the very beginning, like that he was going to redeem these things. So then thousands of years later, Jesus comes. He, he is the second Adam. He restores all things, and he opens up the kingdom once again, right? So now we're, we're, not, we're, we're, we're eating from the tree of life who is Jesus. Jesus is life. See, so that's, that's where we're at now. That is how we get through the gate. I want to read a couple verses to you, and I want us to, I love it, it's already quiet in here, it's so good, ooh, I feel God's going to do something, it's so good, Jesus is so good, God is so holy, Jesus is so holy, do me a favor, I'm going to read these, these verses to you, and I want you to close your eyes, and I just want you to imagine this in your head, Isaiah 6, verses 6 through 4, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet, and with two, they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. I'm going to read another verse, and it's all about Moses bringing the Israelites to Mount Sinai to receive the law. To meet, well, they're actually not to receive the law. They were to, to meet with God. They were to meet with God face to face. It didn't work out that way. But they're preparing themselves for this meeting with God for three days. They're, they're consecrating themselves. They're going through this cleansing process because they're about to walk into the presence of a holy God. Again, I want you to close your eyes. 
On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so that they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us. Put limits around the mountain, set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, Go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them, now, Paul talks about um, you're not coming to a mountain of fear and trembling, but you're coming to Zion, a mountain of joy. But I just want you to keep this picture in mind. This is Old Covenant, but check this out. In Matthew 17, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His, feis, his, feis, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before the Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Why am I reading this to you? <laughs> because we need to get it in our heads that God is holy. He is righteous. He is the fullness of glory. Old covenant, new covenant, new testament. He is the alpha, he is the omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the eternal one. This is God. Don't get me wrong. Like, Jesus is awesome. Jesus is fun. God is fun. He's super, super fun. Like, when, you're, when we're worshiping and God, God has a sense of humor, God is amazing, but he is holy. I think sometimes we live our lives like he is not holy. There's a, um, yeah, he is worthy of everything. Okay, I've got a little disclaimer. I don't want you to come out of this feeling condemned, okay? Like, like I'm not doing enough or whatever. Because I actually, when I was preparing, I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to be too hard on people. And, like, I don't want to come down hard on people. And God's like, let's challenge people. Let's challenge people. Because when, when there is this holy God who came down and, be, and, and, and the fullness of the Father was in Jesus, and, and he actually, he, he was the, the flesh and bone representation image of the Father. Like, like Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. So the same God who went, came down on the mountain was fully wrapped up in Jesus. It's the same person. It's it's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Anyways, I believe that God is challenging us for more. He is the, he's the one who gave everything for us, right? He's, he gave everything. Like, he, he gave up paradise. He came down and he did what he did. He did not have to. He gave up everything for us. So my hope is that you're not con don't feel condemned, but I'm I'm pr my prayer today is that you feel convicted of the worthiness of God. I've been a believer since I was 18 years old. I remember where I was sitting when that seed was planted. I was over in that building. I remember the corner I was in over there, and this word was preached, and the seed got planted to where I couldn't ignore it, and I had to make a choice. I'm like I, I 
like it, this was put right before my, my face, and I'm like, I choose Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus the next day. That was 18 years ago. I was 18. I was 18 years ago. It's pretty awesome. Praise God. And I, I remember at the time, I, was, I had just graduated. Um, I started at Moore Park, and I was just so hungry. I was, you know, I was driving my truck back and forth, and I was just listening to Christian radio. I was just, like, reading the Bible constantly. I was, um, I was reading Christian books. I was just, like, I was just like a sponge, just, just soaking it all up. And here, 18 years later, just barely scratching the surface of how good God is and just the depth of who he is. But the crazy thing is, through that journey of 18 years, and I, I'm probably speaking to mo- a lot of people's journey in here, often I've lost my first love, right? Often I've gotten distracted and I've walked away. Often I've, um, you know, I've, I've lived as though he is not God. Often I've lived, I've gone into different things that were not honoring to him. In any relationship, if there's no intentionality, then the relationship goes stale. Like any, any relationship, like, in any, like a divorce does not just go like one day, oh, I want to get divorced. No, no, it like it's, that's over time, right? If you're not intentional with things, then the relationship fails. The same thing with God, like, but the thing is, he doesn't walk away from us, we walk away from him. Right? He, he, he does not forsake us. He does not leave us or forsake us. So the thing is, if we're not intentional with him, that's when the relationship gets stale. Okay? You guys following me? Okay. I'm not following myself. <laughs> what I'm saying is he's calling us to be intentional in our relationship with him. He's calling us to such a deep place of intentionality because he's worthy. Because he's God. I kind of hear like echoes of Jesus when he to ask Peter, Peter, do you love me? You know, like we always hear Jesus love me, this, loves me, this I know, but do we love Jesus? I'm just going to ask some questions. Like I'm not, again, not, con- not condemning. I'm just asking questions, and I ask myself the same questions. He's calling us deeper. See, Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is all these things. And our relationship to that is we are believers. We believe, right? Jesus came, he said all these things. He, he, he died, he went down to Hades, he, came, he, he rose from the dead, and then he ascended into heaven. We believe that. We are believers, right? And in turn, because of that, because we believe that, we step into a, a reality of being saved, a reality of being redeemed, right? Yeah? Jesus is also teacher, Jesus is also teacher. Now, we've talked about this before, but teachers back in the, if we're, if we're um, looking at what a teacher was in a second temple period context, we have to understand words from that, that area. You can't just like think, what's a teacher? Oh, a school teacher. No, like we need to understand what that was back then, right? You guys with me? So Jesus, he is our teacher. Back in those times, a rabbi was somebody who was not like a school teacher, but somebody who his disciples would follow him so closely that it said the, the hope was that the disciples of a certain rabbi, they would just get the dust off his robe. Like they would follow him through every part of life. That's what a teacher was. Jesus is our teacher. We are, in that context, disciples. See, and with an a- if we're our disciples, there is an aspect of discipline, right? Ooh, there's that word again. Sorry. There's an aspect of discipline in being a disciple. See, we can be believers, and we can stay at a pretty surfacey level all our lives. I believe. I believe in God. Right? But can we really call ourselves disciples if we're not following him so closely that we're getting the dust off his robe? If we're not if Jesus is our Lord, our King, our Savior, thanks for saving me, Jesus, but I'm going to go do this over here. That's all fine and good, but Jesus is also our teacher, and we need to be following him. See, being a disciple is active. It's not passive. Just like that relationship I, I was talking about, it's living with intention. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ without living in, with intention. It's just not going to happen, right? Right? 
you're not going to just wake up one day and feel like being disciplined. <laughs> right? Paul talks about discipline. He says no discipline is, 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 feels good at the moment, but it reaps a harvest of righteousness. See, we are called to discipline. And some people might be hearing called to discipline as like, God, like a punishment. God's punishing me. It's not, not, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actually submitting ourselves to a process. That's what I'm talking about this morning. Being a disciple is doing stuff. See? But someone might say, but that's striving. We're not supposed to strive. No, no, it's not striving. Tell that to Jesus who is intentional in his prayer time, his solitude, his fasting. Like, right? Right? Tell him in his, he was diligent in his studies. We think that maybe, oh, Jesus just knew all the scriptures. No, he, he lived, he was, he walked through life just as anybody would walk through. He learned like anybody else would have learned. Obviously, he was, knew his father. He knew who his father was, but he actually walked and did everything that we would have to do. He was intentional in studying. He was taught. Like, he knew the scriptures, right, because he studied. He was disciplined. Mm-hmm. We actually, uh, for men's group, uh, a couple weeks ago, I don't even know if I talked about this in church. I might have. I, I'm sorry if I'm a broken record, like all the weeks are blurring together, so just bear with me. Um, but we did, we did a fast, and it was, it was incredible. Um, we just decided, you know, it felt like God was calling us in this deeper place because men's ministry started. And it was awesome. It was really good. But then God's like, we got to take these men deeper. So we're like, it just popped up one day. It's like, man, we got to be men. Like, we, like the men in the church are for too long, have been just kind of passive. As men, we're not supposed to be passive, right? We're supposed to be intentional, right? We're supposed to be active. So, like, what do we do? Okay, we start talking, then God, it's just Holy Spirit drops it. We're going to fast. Oh, yeah, let's talk about, yeah, let's fast. So we go on this fast, and we're communicating over text. A lot of guys, it was their first time. A lot of people, they haven't done it in a really long time. Um, and, uh, <laughs> so we go on this fast and we're just like texting and like texting the struggle. This is really hard. I'm super hungry. I got a headache, whatever. But the crazy thing was like afterwards kind of debriefing the fast, how powerful it was, how people were hearing the, the voice of God. Because when we fast, it's not like we're twisting his arm and like, okay, I have to like do, I have to make, punish myself so then I can hear from God. That's not what it is at all. It's actually intentionally putting myself in a place where I, I, am, I am focused on Jesus. There's no other distraction. I'm not going to eat. Why? Because when I eat, I feel full and satisfied. But when I'm hungry, I'm like, I need something to satisfy me. Jesus, would you satisfy me? Right? Come on. So we did this fast and it totally woke us up. It was incredible. Like, I, and actually, I, I started, and through that fast, I started like, I'm like, I got to wake up early. So I started waking up early because for a long time, back in the day, I would wake up super early. But like, you know, with kids and all that stuff, I just like sleep in and I'd fall into the day and be like, you know, read my Bible and be like, ah, but then the kids are pulling on me and stuff. And I'm like, you know what? God deserves that first hour of my day totally uninterrupted. And I started doing that the past couple weeks. And I'm like, it's, it's made such a difference. So I don't know where I'm going with this, but the thing is, like, <laughs> being a disciple is doing stuff. It's being intentional even when it's uncomfortable. No discipline is good at the time, but it reaps a harvest of righteousness, right? Jesus loves me just as I am. He accepts you just as you are. These doors are open to anybody. Anybody could come in here. Jesus accepts you just as you are, but the thing is, when you walk in, you can't stay the same. When you walk into the presence of God, when you meet with Jesus, you cannot stay the same. You cannot stay the same. It's impossible. You could go back, but when you have an encounter with Jesus, it changes you. I think we have an instant gratification culture. Anybody? Yeah? We could stream anything. We can Grubhub anything. We can drive through anything. We can, I mean, like, how easy is, like, now you just pull out your phone and you just, like, boop, 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 order, and then it comes, like, it's instant gratification, right? We have this insta instant gratification culture, and I think it's seeped into the church, and it's called, it's called this. It's called breakthrough culture. Anybody? Breakthrough culture. Anybody heard of that? Like, oh, okay, okay. So I want to be really careful because I'm all for breakthrough. I'm all for breakthrough. I think that 
that's the biggest part of, of, one of the biggest parts of walking with the Lord is he brings breakthrough to the areas where you can't do it yourself, right? That's the thing. We don't, we, there, there is being active, but there's not a doing it by myself, doing it in my flesh. But we have this, this problem with breakthrough culture because it looks like this. I have a problem. I'm going to wait on the Lord. That's what it looks like. I have a problem. I'm going to attend as many conferences as possible, and someone's going to give me the right prophetic word, or somebody's going to do whatever. Somebody, the, the Lord is going to, I'm going to get called out in, you know, in the big auditorium, like the, the preacher on the stage is going to be like, you there, person in the black, the Lord says that all your problems are going to be gone. And that's, that's breakthrough culture. <laughs> that's, that's breakthrough culture because it requires nothing of us. It requires nothing of us. All we have to do is sit on our butt and wait for the Lord. But the thing is, waiting for the Lord is not passive. It is active. Because the Lord speaks things in our lives. Maybe you did receive that prophetic word. But the thing is, it's not just going to happen in my life. I have to partner with things. And I have to walk in that direction. Right? It's not just going to be like, oh, boop, it's going to happen. It's like, no, the Lord is showing his heart for you and what he wants for you. And you have to partner with that. Because, honestly, I, like, I think our breakthroughs should cost something. Like, Jesus paid the ultimate cost? Yes, he did. But if our breakthrough didn't cost anything, we would have no gratitude for what God has done in our lives. We would have no building of character. We would have no way of, like, wow, God, I saw you partner with and lead me through this this way. Not just do it all for me. The same thing with our, with our natural children, right? Like, we don't want to do everything for our children because then they grow up and then they can't do anything for themselves. Like, I'm astonished at, like, how many young people can't cook a meal. Like, really? Can't cook a meal? Like, quesadilla, you know, heat up some cheese, fold it over, cut it, you know? <laughs> like, it's, it's crazy, but it's the same thing. It's like God doesn't want to raise sons and daughters who are not able to walk in authority and know who they are. Because if he did everything for us, then we wouldn't know what we're walking in. Right? We're being trained up to be royalty, guys. Like, we're, t- we're, we're, kings and, we're kings and queens. We are royalty. We are a son of the king. And we're actually being trained up to live like that. He actually wants us to think like that. Right? He actually wants us to be able to do stuff. Come on. <laughs> I think... Often, we use God's grace as an excuse to not not walk through what we need to walk through. Not only that, we use God's grace as an excuse to just do whatever the heck we want. Right? Because, like, the thing is you can't out God's grace. It's impossible. You can't do it. His blood is too, his blood covered everything. Like, you can't out it. Like, he, he is so good. He's, his blood is so powerful. His name is so powerful. You cannot, you cannot out it. It's too much. Right? And everybody with me? You can't do it. But the thing is, there's still a holy standard. And the thing about grace, like, often we think that it's just my, my either my free pass to be lazy and not do anything or my free, free pass to sin. And it's not. Like, Paul is very clear about this. We cannot abuse grace. The wages of sin is death. Jesus overcame death. We are free, no longer condemned by our sin, no longer doomed to perish. That is the power of the gospel, yes. But the, the, the thing is, we've received this, this freedom. We are free, right? In Jesus, we're free. We've been set free. The chains are broken. That's what he did. He came and he set the captives free. See, Jesus says, like, we are set free for freedom. Like, what were you set free for? To serve God. No, Jesus said you were set free to be free. Like, he wants you to be free. But we twist that. The Corinthian church twisted that. I actually, I read a commentary on it. And, uh, okay, I'm going to read the verse. But it says, Paul's, Paul's addressing the Corinthians and addressing this very thing. He says, in quotes, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. See, I was reading a commentary on this, and it was almost like the, the Corinthians took pride in how much they could wrong they could do so they could receive more of God's grace. Isn't that funny? 
I mean, that's a commentary I, I read, so I, I don't know if that's the actual attitude, but the, the thing is, the quotations there, Paul is actually repeating back to them what they've said. He's quoting them, right? They say, I have the right to do anything. I can do anything. In the Amplified, it says, all things are lawful. That is morally legitimate, legitimate, permissible. But then Paul says, not all things are beneficial or advantageous. And they say, all things are lawful, but, uh, you know, but he says, not all things are constructive. I think we do that. I'm going to go over here and do this. Jesus is really forgiving. He's my friend. He's going to forgive me. Yep, he will. He will forgive you. But the thing is, there's more, there's more to that. When we decide to go our own way, be selfish and do our own thing, we're not actually li- moving in love. We're not actually living love. Li- oh, I'm not, gonna, I'm not hurting anybody. When we decide even to do stuff that's going to harm us, we're not moving in love. I was like, I probably said this before, and here I am still. Um, but I was super convicted to start eating better and, you know, take care of my body, not because, not necessarily for me. Yeah, for me, because I want to feel good, whatever. But, like, I want to make sure that I am physically able to care for myself later in life, you know, so, so I'm not going to become a burden, you know. When I throw on my freedom, when I throw it around, I'm not living in love. When I'm undisciplined, I'm not considering my family, my friends. And, and, and hear me, I'm, I'm not, and even destructive habits, right, when we're, when we're you know, s- stuck in not great stuff. And, but I'm not speaking to anyone in here that is, that's actually, like, coming, like, recovering from addiction. Like, keep going. You're in the right place. Come on, keep going. I'm not speaking to that. I am speaking to, the, to people who want to stay in their crap, and say, well, it's my life, it's my freedom, I can do whatever I want. Like, I, I understand that. You have forgiveness, you have grace, but there's other people that are, that are counting on you as well. Get that. Verse 23, or 24. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. I find it very interesting that Paul says, you know, quoting them that they have the right to do anything, he says not everything's beneficial or good, but then he ends it with, no one should seek their own good but the good of others. There is clearly a connection with living right and the wellness of others, the well-being of others. Hmm. So God's grace isn't some cheap free pass. You know, Jesus did it all for me, so I'm just going to sit here and, and be, right? I get that. Like, yeah, we need to be, we need to live into our identity, but it's less be, but become. You guys with me? All right. You guys are so quiet. (laughs) The invitation is to be, but truly it's to become. He's given us the privilege to be disciples so we could become like him. Jesus, like one of our core beliefs is Jesus did it all. And, uh, and I f- yeah, firmly believe that. Jesus, he did it all. Anything we could ever need, Jesus, any problem we have, any, Jesus has a solution. Jesus, he, he conquered sin. He conquered death. He did. He did all that. But he requires our participation. We're called to co-labor with Christ, like Sandy said earlier. His precious blood was spilt and his body was broken willingly. Did you guys know in Matthew 5, 48, it says this. It says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Ooh, that sounds really hard. That's impossible. But the the crazy thing is um, Jesus wouldn't say anything that's not possible. But let me dive into this a little more because let's talk a little bit about the Hebrew understanding of this because a Greek, let's take an olive tree. Tersha talked about this a long time ago. But let's take an olive tree, right? A Greek would come up to this olive tree and look at, like, is the tree symmetrical? Is the tree pleasing to the eye? Is it, um, does it have, like, lots of nice foliage? Is it, is, it a, is it a nice looking tree? That's what a Greek would be asking. That's a perfect tree. A perfect tree would be perfectly symmetrical. A Hebrew, Hebrew thinking would say, 
is the tree functioning in its purpose? That's perfect. Is the tree producing olives? Like a lot of olives? Good, the tree's perfect. See, grace gets us to this place where we can be perfect in the sense that we're functioning in our purpose. That's perfection. We're going to screw up sometimes, and that's, that is what it is. Like, that we're people. So, but that grace empowers us to live into our purpose. Does that make sense? Being disciples should translate into action. Our, our freedom should benefit others. James 2, 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. Whew, you foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. We always come against works and striving and all this stuff, which I agree with. We can't strive for salvation. We can't strive for God's approval. But the thing is, we are called for our, for our lives with Jesus to overflow into good works, right? Jesus talks about, or I suppose Jesus, I don't know. Anyways, we got, we got some good works prepared for us to do, okay? Right? We've got good works prepared for us to do. Faith, our faith requires partnership. It requires doing stuff. See, if, if our lives aren't, if, if works aren't coming out of our lives, good works aren't coming out of our lives, there's just a kink in the pipe somewhere. <laughs> That's, again, no condemnation. Like, let's unkink, we just got to unkink those pipes. I want to go back a little bit, actually. And I, I f- okay. I want to go back to process. I want to go back to breakthrough. Um, I just had the sense that maybe somebody's taking on, maybe you're struggling with something that you think that is for your breakthrough, but it's actually not. Um, Anything that, like, any sickness or the demonic coming and attacking you and you feel like that's a process you need to work through, that's not a process you need to work through. That's something you need to get out. That's something that needs to be broken by the power of Jesus. So just want to take a little side note. If, if it's, a, like, like sickness and death are from the enemy, that's the fingerprints of the enemy. So if you're partnering with the, the, a lie that says that God gave that to you and then that's for your, to, to, like, to, like, teach you something, that is a lie from the pit of hell. So I'm just going to throw that out there. If that's anybody in this room, um, don't partner with that. That is a lie. If you're struggling with something like that, come up after and get freedom. Come on. Mm. When we stop being lazy in our faith, that's when the world benefits. I, I like just church and church history, fathers and mothers of the faith and saints and just reading how like they would go, they, they would have this such devotion to God that it would actually flow out and transform their culture. That's what I want. That's what I want. It is flowing in power. It is, it is walking in the authority of Jesus, but it is also being a disciple and knowing how to do that and understanding it more because sometimes we just don't understand it when we don't actually go let him bring us deeper. Right? Come on. Jesus said that rivers of living water will flow out of you. It says, he got up and said, anyone who's thirsty, drink, drink from me. And he says, and those who believe rivers of living water will flow out of them. And it's the thing is, it's not for us. If it's flowing out of us, who's it for? Everyone else. So if we're not drinking from him, 
it's not just going to flow out of us from nowhere. It's got to come from somewhere, and it comes from him. If we're not drinking from him, it's, we're dried up. We need to start drinking from him, and as you drink from him every single day, all the time, it's going to just start to flow out. It's not just like a, and you will release rivers of living water. It says, and rivers of living water will flow from you, uninhibited. It's just going to come out, and it's going to bless. See, the thing is, water, water flows where it needs to, right? It's going to flow where it needs to. I want to go back to the very beginning when we read those verses, like especially the verse about God's throne room. Everything that's going on in there, and the thing is, like, it's talking about the, you know, the, the threshold and the, and the posts trembling and smoke filling the temple, and there's voices in there, but it's not even the voice of God. It's the voice of the seraphim that are surrounding him, and there's such awe in the room, and it's not even God speaking. It's just the mate, the created beings around him. Imagine the might, the power, and the glory of God. And the thing is, that's the throne room of God. When he came, when, when, the, is, when, when um, the Israelites were, were like in the wilderness and walking around, and, and then they, they came and they built a temple, the, the spirit of God dwelt in the temple. And then Jesus comes, he redeems our bodies, and now the Spirit of God resides in this temple. The same God who we read at the beginning, Almighty God, powerful God, is the same one who resides in this temple. When it talks about our body as a temple of the Holy Spirit, it's referring to sexual immorality. It's saying, Do not join yourself with a prostitute. Don't you know you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? We have the privilege and the high calling of carrying the spirit, the fullness of the spirit of God inside of us. I think we need to be very, very careful how we live. Again, I don't want to come across as condemning because often we can get like a really feel-good message. And I, I like, and I, I love that, like, because it, it's true. It's the gospel, right? It's Jesus did everything we couldn't do. Like, like I just put on the righteousness of Christ, and I, I, am, I am made righteous. That's good news, right? Because of what Jesus did, because of the victory of Jesus, I get to put on the righteousness of Christ. Amazing. Amazing. But on the other hand, I need to walk in the way, realizing and with the revelation that God is holy, and he's actually calling me to a high standard. <laughs> You know, it's funny because certain, like, eschatologies, like end times beliefs are like, well, we need to, all these things need to happen, and then they need to rebuild the temple and all this. Like, what the heck? That doesn't even make any sense. It does not make any sense. Why would God do something, go back to something so obsolete where only one person got to go into the presence of God once a year and, and, um, and like, pray and for the atonement of the entire nation where now the holy the holy spirit comes in us jesus dies to atone for the whole world and the holy spirit comes to live in this temple because what he wanted all along was union and now he has union when we receive jesus we are in union complete union with the holy spirit he's the one worthy of everything Paul compared everything else, everything else to this word, scubalong or something, and it actually is the word S-H-I-T. I didn't say it, but that's what he said. Every, <laughs> I consider all that stuff a bunch of big pile of, you know what, compared to knowing Christ, <laughs> compared to actually getting the opportunity to dive deep with him. He wants to bring us deeper, guys. He doesn't want us to skim along the surface. Why? Because he's got so much good stuff for us. Because we're not going to be satisfied by the things in this world. It's just not, maybe for a moment, maybe for a moment we'll be satisfied. But everybody gets to the point in their lives where they say, I am not satisfied. I had everything. Even people that have everything they want, they get to this point, have a midlife, midlife crisis. I'm not satisfied. 
Jesus is the only one who can satisfy. That's why we become disciples, because he's teaching us a better way to live. He's teaching us to actually step into our identity, right, and walk as he walked, and to actually experience him. That's the point. The point isn't being a good person. The point is experiencing him. The point is not being a good person. The point is being like him, right? I don't know who quoted it, and someone's going to get mad, but (laughs) there's this quote that says, the son of man, or the son of God became man, so man could become like God. So I was like, ooh, 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 that sounds icky. But the truth is, even in the beginning, Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. And now God gives us the opportunity to become sons and daughters who represent and look like him. Right? We become like God. Right? We, we actually participate in the divine nature. It says, it's not saying we become God. I'm not God. I don't want to be God. I don't want to run things. Like, God does a, I would do a horrible job. But the thing is, we become like him as a son or a daughter becomes like their parents, right? We become like him. I don't know where I'm going with that, but. Oh, and my hammer. Oh, man. So, oh, the hammer. Yes, I got this. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, Got this, I think, the second Pentecost night. And and, um, it was after because I felt like what we were doing is we were contending for breakthrough. And we felt, what, is, what does breakthrough look like? And it looks an awful lot like this. It looks like this is heavy, and I'm going to swing it at things. Has anybody ever broken up a bunch of concrete with a sledgehammer? Yes. That's a lot of work, right? You're like, man, I wish I had a jackhammer. <laughs> but I think that's what it looks like. I think that, because even after, it feels real good. It feels really good to hit stuff with a hammer. But um, <laughs> anyways, that's what that's there for. God's like, bring your hammer. That's Thor, not not Yahweh. Um, anyways, okay, worship team, you guys come up. I'm now I'm rambling. Um, I really, guys, I like. We're, um, I really encourage you to like. We're gonna start this. Um, we're starting today this awe of God series, and and it could be like just any other. Seem like any other series where we just kind of like, oh, we're gonna. This will be nice. This is a great series, and oh, this will you know make everyone feel good. But this, that's not it at all. Um, that is something that the church is missing as a whole, is the awe of God. Because we've gotten so used to, we've, we've got this image of God where he's just buddy Jesus, mm. right? And I'm not saying like he, Jesus, like I said before, Jesus is the fullness of the Father. You look at Jesus, you see the Father, but he is holy. I don't, I don't recommend this movie, but it's that movie Dogma where there's like, they literally have a buddy Jesus. And they're like, I'm trying to be relevant with the kids. And he's like, like this, that's not Jesus. Jesus was kind. He was not nice. Kindness brings me out of my crap. Kindness doesn't leave me in my crap. Yeah. So I encourage you to join. The, any, there's plenty of groups going f- with the Awe of God series. That's going to change everything in your life. It's already changed a bunch in my life. So, Yeah, God, we just lift you up. We just declare that you are holy, that you are worthy of everything we are. God, if there's areas in our lives where we're just not wanting to surrender, Lord, would you give us the strength to surrender those? God, would you just, if we don't even have the desire to get into your word, if we don't even have the desire to pray, if we don't have the desire for any of that, right now, Lord, we pray for hunger in this room. We pray for hunger in this room, hunger for you, hunger for who you are, Lord, not hungry for what you could give us, not for what you could bring us, but hungry for you, hungry to see your face. We don't seek your hand, Lord. We seek your face. We seek your holiness. We seek your righteousness, God. We are to be set apart in this area. We're not to look like everybody else. We're to be walking as a holy nation, just as you you meant for Israel to be a holy nation before you, Lord. We are grafted into that promise, Lord, and now we are a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. Jesus, would you just send your spirit in this room right now? Would you fill those spaces that need to be filled, Lord? Would you convict the hearts that need to be convicted, Lord? Would you bring to mind the things that need to go right now in this room, the things that we've been holding on to? Maybe it's something something we're walking in that is not of you, but Lord, I just can't let it go. What if I let it go, then I'm gonna have this huge void in my life. Well, guess what? He'll fill the void. So if that's you this morning, if you have something you need to give up, give it up right now. Just lay it before the feet of Jesus.
praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen.